I look at these as very much family meetings, and perhaps that's as good a theme as I can suggest for my talk, because the, the message that I would like to convey between now and 9 o'clock, if I've read the program correctly, is that um, thyroid disease, Graves' disease, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, are part of a family. The family is the family of autoimmune diseases. As we will see, the autoimmune diseases are highly varied because they can affect any location in the body. But like all members of a family, they have also a great deal in common. They share a uh, pool of genes, they share a genetic background, they often share environmental exposures, and we will discuss those a bit. But I'd like to emphasize the importance of thinking of the autoimmune diseases as part of a larger family not instead of as individual diseases, but in addition to thinking of them as important medical issues in themselves. Why is it important to think of the autoimmune diseases collectively in addition to singularly? Well, it's important to patients because autoimmune diseases like family members tend to cluster, tend to go together. And uh, people with a, uh, an auto, one autoimmune disease have a certain increased risk of a second or even a third autoimmune disease. It's equally important for physicians to think of autoimmune diseases collectively because we need to be aware of the fact that a patient with one autoimmune disease may have another and that other related family members may also have a somewhat heightened increase in autoimmune disease. We need to think of it also in our, uh, in our um, uh, role as, uh, as uh, public citizens because as we think of autoimmune diseases collectively, we realize the size of the problem. Most of the autoimmune diseases, and I'll deal with this in a few minutes, most of the autoimmune diseases, if we look at them singularly, are really not that common. Now, the thyroid diseases are fairly common, as we will see, but most of the diseases that we think of as autoimmune diseases are fairly uncommon. On my way out, I uh, read a, uh, an issue of the latest journal Science, the, the major journal in our field, and there's a very interesting article relating the amount of research support that goes into different diseases in the United States. This is mostly NIH, somewhat also a, a, a Department of Defense support. It's very much related to public interest and public activity. In fact, it's related to lobbying. And if we want to see the autoimmune diseases receive the kind of attention to the public and to the Congress that they need and deserve if there's going to be progress in this field, we also need to think of them in a collective sense, in a combined sense, because then we're talking about major issues, as we'll see issues as big as cancer, as big as heart disease. And perhaps uh, most important, we need to think of autoimmune diseases collectively because it's those common traits, those things that all of the diverse autoimmune diseases share that are the most fundamental the root causes, if you would, of autoimmune diseases. We don't have a cure, a real cure, for any autoimmune disease. We have ways of managing the symptoms of autoimmune diseases. Fortunately, we're able to 
alleviate many of the problems and to extend the life of patients with autoimmune diseases. But we don't have a cure because we can see these diseases only late in the course of the disease, only after the damage has occurred. We need to learn more about how these diseases come about and be able to intervene earlier when there's the possibility of actually reversing this common autoimmune process that is responsible for all of the autoimmune diseases. So that's my message, that's my mission, to tell you why it is important for all of us to keep in mind that the autoimmune diseases are family members and we need to support the whole family as well as the individual. So if I can operate yeah. this, let's see, the lower one, there we go. Okay, there are only two options, so I uh, try the wrong one first. I'd like to start by just defining two terms that we're going to be hearing for the next uh, day and a half, autoimmunity and autoimmune disease. So autoimmunity, well, we know what immunity is. We know that immunity is the the way the body protects itself against infection. And that's the core function of the immune response. Well, there are many, many different infections and new infections are coming along all the time. So the immune system is highly diverse and it's able to recognize many, many different kinds of, uh, of pathogenic organisms, many different viruses and bacteria and, and protozoa and so forth. And new ones are always arriving and the immune system has to be able to contend with them. And we often wondered, and in fact, this is really how I got started in this field, then why aren't we immune to ourselves? Because we're immune to everything else. Why aren't we immune to ourselves? Well, the short answer is we are. We're developing autoimmunity all the time. All of us are. We're generating the cells that are responsible for autoimmunity. I think most of you know the terms T cells and B cells. Those are the blood cells, the white blood cells that are responsible for the specific immunity that provides us with the protection that we need against bacterial and viral infections. Many of these will react with molecules in our own bodies, substances in our own bodies. And that's all that autoimmunity is. It's just immunity that reacts with something in the body of the host. That's, that's, that's what autoimmunity is. It's just another form of immunity, but the result is a response to or a reaction with something in the body. And that's, it's going on in most of us all the time. But it is highly regulated. It's highly controlled because it's dangerous. And like most physiologic systems, and the immune system is another physiologic system, it's powerful and it has to be regulated carefully. So we have in place, all of us, who, uh, well, those of us who don't have an autoimmune disease at this time, some of us in this room, are doing a somewhat better job in regulating the autoimmunity than some others are. And when the controls are inadequate, and when the autoimmune response goes on in a more rigorous, vigorous, out of control way, then pathology results, and that's what autoimmune disease is. So the two are not synonymous, and the presence of autoimmunity by itself is not a dire, uh, well, may, not, may be a sign of something in the future, but it is not by itself disease. Immunity is, autoimmunity is not disease. Autoimmune disease is the consequence of an out of control, an, a dysregulated autoimmune response. I think an important point because often uh, uh, people will equate the presence of autoantibodies, which are autoimmunity, with autoimmune disease. We can have autoantibodies, um, and m all of us do, in fact. We all have some autoantibodies all the time, natural autoantibodies. They're not harmful. So it's not the 
Uh, it's not the presence of the autoantibody that determines the presence or absence of disease. That's just a diagnostic sign along with many other clinical signs that the physician uses to diagnose the disease. So that's an important uh, distinction to make, and it becomes more and more important as we continue our discussion. Um, but uh, because I want to introduce the broad topic of autoimmune disease. And let's see, which one was I using? Yeah. So I've said that autoimmune diseases are very different in their clinical appearance because there is, ladies and gentlemen, autoimmune disease for every organ in the body. There is an autoimmune disease for everything, from the brain to the stomach to the, to the nerves uh, to the skin, uh, you name it. And I'll show you that in, in just a minute. So the clinical presentation, as we call it, the way the patient determines the disease, the way the physician diagnoses the disease depends on where it is. And of course, that also means that the diseases are treated by many different physicians and studied by many different kinds of scientists. That's one reason why it, it has uh, not been common in the past for us to think of the autoimmune diseases collectively. Been one of the one of the uh, hazards, let's say, of the fact these diseases are so different. But if we think of them together, as I was alluding to before, they are very common. So NIH estimates there are uh, uh, somewhere in the order I'd like to say about 20 million people. About 20 million people in the United States of America have an autoimmune. disease. So if you look at the bottom, you see that's about the same number of patients with heart disease. It's uh, twice as many as patients with cancer. We have a National Heart Institute. We have a National Cancer Institute. We have big national societies that are doing wonderful work, and God bless them. We don't have a big autoimmune disease institute. We don't have lucrative national associations that are supporting research in this area. So that's what I was referring to previously, was very little national attention to these very common diseases. They are expensive diseases. I mean that both financially and socially. They are very costly diseases because they are, in most cases, lifelong, and they require lifelong treatment. And they are familial diseases because autoimmune diseases, and I think people here can attest to this, involve the whole family. They are also life-threatening. Um, they are among the 10 top causes of death in women in the United States. So they are a serious clinical problem, and they require careful medical management. Well, I've said there's an autoimmune disease for every organ system, and I'm just going to uh, uh, verify that by showing you a list of autoimmune diseases. I'm not going to pause over them, but just want to illustrate that these are diseases that, that I think virtually everybody here has heard of, but many of you don't realize that they are all members of the family. They're all members of the autoimmune disease family, and we need to be concerned with all of them. So here are some, uh, and, uh, and uh, here are some more. And so they are, as I've said, clinically very, very different, seen by different kinds of physicians and treated often in very different ways. But the point that I'm going to be emphasizing are the commonalities, the common threads that unite all of these diseases. Well, I said something about the prevalence of autoimmune disease. This is what's called a bar graph, and the, these bars uh, are, uh, are an indication of how common the diseases are. And there are lots of diseases uh, over here on the, uh, um, be on your left. Most of the autoimmune diseases in uh, type 1, uh, type diabetes, for example, IDDM, and pernicious anemia, multiple sclerosis, lupus, glomerulonephritis, Sjogren's. Most of these diseases are pretty rare. There are only three autoimmune diseases, in fact, that we consider relatively common. And uh, one of them is rheumatoid arthritis. 
and the other two are the diseases that are the topics of these uh, meetings, Graves' disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Those are diseases that affect four or five percent of women in the United States. So in a way, these are the exceptions to the rule, but it's only if we think of these diseases together that we realize how common the problem is. You'll also notice these bars are filled at the bottom and with our solid at the bottom and stippled at the top. So the, the bottom is the female component. And uh, you can see most of the autoimmune diseases are predominantly in females. About 78%, if you look at all of the autoimmune diseases, 78% of patients with autoimmune disease are women. It's probably the question I'm asked most by medical students is why, why women? So I thought I had to put up at least two slides to, to begin to answer that question. This is the first slide. It shows the uh, occurrence of a number of the autoimmune diseases, uh, including uh, the thyroid diseases. Uh, the, um, the pink bars, they're, they're supposed to be pink, are the, are the girls and the blue ones are the boys, in other words, the women and the, the men. And the striking thing about this is that it is a spectrum, that it is not just all the females on one side and all the males on the other. It's not what we call a dichotomy, it's a spectrum. And when we see a spectrum, we realize that this is a, that there are multiple causes of the difference. So the short answer to your question of why females is there's no single answer to it. And in fact, there are some autoimmune diseases and type 1 diabetes is over here on the far left. Uh, myocarditis, a disease that I'm particularly studying, is more in males. Ankylosing spondylitis is more in males. So there are certain diseases that are more common in males, and that's important too. But the short answer is that there are a number of different features that are involved. This just lists them. I'm not going to go through the items on the list just uh, for the sake of time, but I, I will just broad, give you the broad picture. The, the first reason, the, the most uh, dramatic effect is uh, the connection between the immune regulatory system and the endocrine regulatory system. These two have to work together, and these two use common signals. Many of the signaling molecules in the immune system are also the signaling molecules in the endocrine system. So there's a close connection, and we see that the, uh, the sex-related hormones, the steroid hormones like estrogens, have an effect on certain autoimmune responses, particularly studied in lupus, different autoimmune disease, but one which, again, shares many of the properties that we're talking about. And autoimmune diseases are very much, uh, they're related to endocrine changes and tend to, uh, tend to occur when there are the most dramatic changes in uh, endocrine levels. So puberty, menopause, these are times when the immune system tends to deregulate because the, um, the endocrine system is changing rapidly at that time. And we'll see that age is an important feature. Prolactin is one of the several pituitary hormones that also has been shown to have an effect on immune responses. But um, pregnancy itself has an effect. We know now there's an exchange of these lymphocytes, T cells and B cells, during pregnancy, and so the, uh, the mother and the, uh, and the, um, uh, the fetus tend to exchange red uh, white blood cells, and that generates an immune response on both sides, actually. Uh, and, and that, we think, can also contribute to autoimmune disease. Uh, that's called microchimerism, meaning a person made up of two different cell, cells of origin, partly maternal, partly fetal in origin. The X chromosomes, you remember women have two X chromosomes, men have one, and we know, the, that we know that some of the genetic features of autoimmune disease are found on the X chromosome. So if, if you have two, then you have a somewhat greater likelihood 
of autoimmune disease. And maybe the most dramatic thing is that autoimmune diseases very much fluctuate during pregnancy. Pregnancy itself is, is, is quite an important component of autoimmune disease because some diseases get remarkably better uh, during pregnancy and others actually get worse during pregnancy. So it has an effect, although uh, it's difficult to, to sort out exactly what the effect is, but it is a time when there is a dramatic change in the endocrine system. So that gives you some idea of, of why even people who um, may be genetically uh, very similar will be very different because of the, um, the, the, the hormones are interacting with the genes to regulate expression of genetic traits, something we now call epigenetics. So epigenetics is important in autoimmune disease as it is in diseases. Genetic, epigenetics means what occurs after the genes themselves have done their job, then it becomes a matter of, well, how, then how are the genes being expressed? And that's become a major area of research. Well, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we understand about autoimmune diseases from the age of patients, the ages at which autoimmune diseases occur, the areas in which they occur, and ethnic differences. So let's look at just briefly some of these features and see what they may tell us about autoimmune disease. Now this is a slide of Europe, a picture of Europe, and uh, it's perhaps not quite as clear as I might have hoped, but you'll see that the countries to the north of Europe are darker and become lighter as you go on south. And that's, that's a striking feature of most autoimmune diseases, not all of them, but most of them follow this pattern. The pattern that the further you are from the equator, the more likely you are to develop an autoimmune disease. So there are high rates of autoimmune diseases, this happens to pertain to multiple sclerosis and type 1 diabetes in children, but this is true for most autoimmune disorders. They're more common in Northern Europe than Southern Europe. They're more common in Canada and the Northern United States than the Southern States. In Australia, of course, it's the other way around. They're more common in South Australia than in North Australia. So one of the things that gives you the, the that, that increases the risk of an autoimmune disease is where you live. And that's particularly true up to uh, the age of, uh, of of 12, and so you carry that risk with you. If you go from a high risk to a low risk area, you carry that risk with you. So there's something that's occurring in many autoimmune diseases anyway, that, that's important early in life that you tend to, to keep. But where you grew up is, is an important, one of the important features. And part of that may be genetic, part of that may be exposure. Now these days we're very interested in vitamin D. And of course, vitamin D varies depending on where you grow up. Um, your skin color is an important determining feature. So it, it, it's not that there's a simple answer, but there are clues here that are important in understanding how autoimmune diseases occur. Um, these, these happen to be recent figures from the United States, um, comparing United States and Europe, and they, they show the same thing, that uh, the further south you go, the less autoimmune disease there is, and this is perhaps not the best slide. I will withdraw this one. I think I won't use that one again. It's a bit too complicated. But. Another important feature is who your, your ancestors were. So this happens to be one study, this happens to be one on, on lupus, because I'm, again, I'm trying to show you the broad spectrum of autoimmune diseases. Um, and this shows different ethnic groups in the same communities in England. So people regarded as white, and white just is the way people regard themselves, these are always designated by individuals uh, themselves, so those who are white um, uh, have a certain prevalence of autoimmune disease. If you are Indo-Asian, and these people dis discern themselves or designate themselves that way, you see your risk is 
is much greater, 20 versus 50. It's, it's more than twice as, as, as common. And then another study in another part of England, white, Indo-Asian, and Afro-Caribbean. Uh, and the uh, people of, of African origin especially uh, can be quite susceptible to autoimmune disease. Um, and in the United States, where several studies have been done comparing Americans of European origin with those of African origin, the, the rate of lupus is at least tenfold higher in African Americans, and it tends to start earlier and be more severe. So it is not a minor consideration, but it's certainly something that will give us information and is giving us information as to what is important in the causation really want to know what is important in the risk of developing, the probability of developing an autoimmune disease. So you're, the, where you uh, grew up, where your uh, ancestors came from, those are important elements. Uh, this uh, actually is a, a study that um, we did just uh, recently on um, samples, serum samples from the Department of Defense. So these are military personnel. Um, rather interestingly, this, this also showed, so if you look at military personnel and uh, these are percentages uh, who have Graves' disease and uh, Hashimoto's disease, Hashimoto's is, is, uh, um, is more common in um, uh, European Americans, white, white Americans, uh, whereas Hashimoto's disease is relatively rare in African Americans, just the opposite of lupus. Uh, and Hispanics, uh, it's also relatively rare, whereas Graves' disease is much more equal, but if anything is somewhat more common in African Americans than European Americans. So, you know, there's also information in, in what, your, what your ethnic background is. Now, again, some of this may be genetic, some of this may be exposure, dietary, there could be other features, but those are things we need to dissect out. Those are things we need to understand if we want to know who's going to develop autoimmune disease. Age is perhaps one of the most important things to consider because Every autoimmune disease has a predilection for certain ages. This happens to be a Graves' disease study. This is not our study, but it's a fairly recent one, showing the prevalence of Graves' disease over age. The ages are along here. And uh, these, this is the curve for uh, women. And you see it r begins to go up at about the age of 15. Uh, rises very steeply and reaches a peak in the 30s and 40s. So these are diseases of women in their childbearing years. And this is true for most, but not all, autoimmune diseases. Most autoimmune diseases are most, most commonly begin in women during their uh, childbearing years, during their young years, which has important family and social uh, relationships or connotations, uh, and then the the uh, the incidence, not the prevalence. The incidence tends to go down. The prevalence goes down much more slowly. Whereas in men, you see the the uh, prevalence of disease is fairly constant through the lifespan. Now there are some diseases that tend to affect older people. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is one. There's some like uh, rheumatic fever. Uh, that tend to affect younger people. So I don't want to say these diseases occur only in those years, but predominantly the autoimmune diseases are diseases of women and women in their childbearing years. That's the group at greatest risk for developing an autoimmune disease, for the onset, for the onset of an autoimmune disease. <coughs> Perhaps one of the most concerning findings in epidemiology of autoimmune diseases is that they are going up. And almost every autoimmune disease that's being followed is increasing. So this is the rising increase of Hashimoto's thyroiditis over years, starting uh, 
the rise started, I think, 1988, and now has gone up. Now, why does that happen? Well, there are two possible answers. Ascertainment and a real increase. Ascertainment means that we have better tools for diagnosing the disease. Physicians are more aware of the disease. In medicine, we say you find what you look for. So awareness is an important part of this. The diagnostic tools are an important part of this. Do we have better ways of, of determining the disease? So that's part of it, and that's an important part to keep in mind. But even in diseases where that does not seem to be the case, and uh, type 1 di diabetes in Finland is perhaps the, the best case we have, because this is a disease in which the diagnostic criteria for type 1 diabetes did not change in Finland, and where ascertainment is not a problem because they have a national health scheme where everybody's seen and, and the standard of treatment is pretty much the same. And this curve you may not be able to see too well, but you'll notice that starting in about 1980, it began to go up, and it's continuing to up, and it's continuing to go up at an increasing rate. So it's not only rising, but it's an, a rising rapidly, more and more rapidly, and that is very concerning, and most autoimmune diseases are showing this. So in addition to improved ascertainment, which is good, means we're finding the diseases more often, we have better tools, they are also going up, and that's not good. That is very, very concerning. Now, why are they going up? Well, is it genetics? Not very likely. Genetics doesn't change between 1980 and, and uh, 2012. So there's something in the environment, something that we're being exposed to, that's making autoimmune diseases, broadly speaking, increase in incidence. All right, that having been said, what are the causes of autoimmune disease? Well, these are the causes of autoimmune disease, and this fits virtually any autoimmune disease on the list. So every autoimmune disease that has been seriously studied has a genetic predisposition. Um, it has an endocrine effect, which involves the expression of the genes that we inherit, and then there's an environmental factor. So I've talked about the endocrine effect. I won't go back to that, but let's talk a little bit about genetics. And the original notion that there is a genetic uh, component of autoimmune disease really started with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That was the first disease where it was really seriously considered. And that when it was realized the two things clinically were observed by good clinicians. Good clinicians are where the really basic ideas come from in this field. They noticed that there were multiple cases in the same family and that the, the patient was more likely to have a second or a third autoimmune disease. So that's the clustering of autoimmune diseases that I, re that I referred to previously. And that's the basic, that was the basic clue that suggested to us that there must be a genetic component. Well, that's a clue, but of course, members of a family share lots of other things other than genes, so you have to begin to tease out the genetic component. And that's done by this kind of study called twin concurrence. Now, twin concurrence studies are done by comparing the incidence of a disease, like Hashimoto's disease, or like lupus, or like multiple sclerosis, comparing genetically identical twins with genetically non-identical twins, so-called um, um, monozygotic versus dizygotic twins. In other words, uh, whether they're genetically identical twins or whether the twins are no more identical than any other brothers or, or brother or sister. And if you do that comparison, the results are, are broadly distributed, but generally show that the concurrence rate, the, the, the fact, the, the possibility that if one twin has a disease, the other twin will develop that disease or a related disease is about a third, about a 30 percent. 
concurrence rate. So it's nowhere near 100%. It doesn't mean these diseases are, are genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia or hemophilia. They're not single gene. They're multiple gene diseases. But putting it all together, can, the, the susceptibility or the risk of an autoimmune disease, you inherit about a, about a third of that. And that's been true for virtually every autoimmune disease that's been studied. You know, it seems to be a general rule. Furthermore, that is a multiple, uh, that's, that's the, 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 there are multiple genes involved in this. So these are multiple gene traits. But in, again, in every autoimmune disease that's been studied, one of the common features is that about half of the risk is a certain um, a group of genes that we call the major histocompatibility complex genes, MHC, major histocompatibility complex. What are those? Those are disease, those are genes that were discovered when surgeons did transplantation of, of kidneys and skin and so forth, and they found that, of course, these are rejected because they are genetically different. When you give somebody somebody else's kidney, it would be rejected if we didn't match them, and that matching is mainly due to a, a, a certain group of traits that we call the major histocompatibility, histos tissue compatibility genes, MHC. So you'll see that. In the human, the MHC genes are called HLA, so many of you will see that. So those the, the genes of that group, and that's a small segment of genes, it's, it's a few centimorgans long actually, just a little bit of our whole genome is represented there, and those are important genes, and we now realize they're important because those are genes that regulate the immune response. Those are important immunoregulatory genes. Then there are many, many other regulatory genes, the ones that keep us healthy day in and day out, the ones that prevent the progression from autoimmunity to autoimmune disease. Those are multiple genes, and those are the ones that are contributing to susceptibility to autoimmune disease. And so as we begin to look at genetic diversity among those regulatory genes, we find that, that they play a role and that that role goes across different autoimmune disorders. So that's the kind of evidence that we have that these diseases are genetic. Now what's the importance of that? Well, this is how it plays out. So let's look at risk of uh, Graves' disease. Just as one example, I could use many other examples of this, but I happen to find these data, which are very good. So we've talked about twins, and if you have an identical twin, you see it's a little less for this disease than some of the others, but if, if uh, you can think of one as being no increased risk, it means you have the same risk as anybody else, so if you have an identical twin, your risk is, is uh, 13 times greater. Pretty, pretty important. One parent, uh, your risk is about six-fold greater. One sibling, it's uh, about the same. So, and if it's, a, if it's a first cousin, it's much less. I didn't have that on the slide, but first cousins have, again, some risk, but very low, one or two, one or two percent. And then, of course, it gets lower and lower, never gets quite down to one, but uh, it, it's slightly higher depending on how many relatives you have with that disease. Interestingly, what's this down here? A spouse, it's about twice as much. So what is that? <laughs> Anybody know? Well, that's the non-inherited risk, the environmental risk. So you remember George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush? They both have thyroid disease. That's not genetic. As far as I know, they're not related <laughs> not any more than any other human beings. No, that's, that's, presumably that's the environment. So the other half of the story is the environment. And um, there are many, many environmental factors. Drugs are perhaps the best characterized ones, viruses, bacteria. I'm going to mention foods in a minute. All of these are implicated 
but the sorry answer is we don't have good solid data. We don't, we don't understand yet much about most of the environmental agents. Now, the one good example is thyroid disease and Hashimoto's disease, where we know at least one environmental component is iodine. So iodine is one of those Goldilocks things. You need to have just the right amount. If you have too little, then your thyroid isn't working, you don't have a goiter. If you have too much iodine in your diet, you tend to develop thyroid autoimmunity and Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Graves' disease. So this is one of the few environmental agents we know about. <clears throat> I should put smoking on this list, by the way. It's a big one for autoimmune diseases. So this summarizes what I've been saying. Autoimmune diseases have a large environmental component, and they have a genetic component, half of it MHC, <clears throat> and half of it non-MHC genes. Well, what's happening in this disease? And I want to end on this note. This is a study that was it's now about nine years old of lupus, a backward-looking study. So if we look at patients who are diagnosed with lupus, and we look to see were there early signs of lupus, were there early markers of lupus, and in this case, antibodies that could have told us that this is a, a person, a woman, who is destined to develop lupus? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. There are clues. And we see that in a, this is an in, these are antibodies. They're characteristic of lupus. And they tend to go up, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> This is when the disease occurred, when it becomes clinically evident. But this rise in multiple antibodies is characteristic that the disease is on its way. And this starts about uh, seven years, six or seven years before the disease is clinically diagnosed. And for thyroid disease, we happen to have just done a study, again, of military personnel in exactly the same story. So we have multiple antibodies to thyroglobulin, thyroperoxidase, and TSH. And again, these antibodies are beginning to come up, particularly the, uh, the um, thyroperoxidase antibody, TPO antibody, start to come up about seven years before the patient is ever seen and diagnosed with either Graves' disease or Hashimoto's. So there are clues, and we're beginning to find out what those clues are. So what is the message that I would like to leave with you? Well, first of all, autoimmune disease, collectively, autoimmune diseases, if we look at them as a family of diseases, are a large and a growing problem in this country, clinically, public health-wise, economically, whatever you wish. Autoimmune diseases are highly diverse because they can affect any site in the body, but there are basic common mechanisms underlying all of these autoimmune diseases that we must learn to understand. We must understand how they come about. We must understand their etiology, their cause. And part of it is genetic, and we've made great progress in that area. Part of it is environmental triggers, and we've made very little progress in that area. Much to be learned, because we can do much more about environmental triggers than we can about altering genetics. And finally, there's evidence that autoimmunity is on the track, is on its way to be out of control long before there are any clinical signs that will allow the diagnosis to be made. So this is the final <coughs> lesson. Let's think of autoimmune diseases then as a train of events. We'd say the major goal for us in the field of autoimmune disease studies, diverse as these diseases are in their anatomical location and their clinical manifestation, these diseases are related because they have the same etiology, they have the same cause. They are all caused by the train of autoimmunity, that is the progression of autoimmunity out of control. 
to develop treatment, if we really want to treat the cause of an autoimmune disease, we have to begin to treat the disease as it, it, it by, by the cause of the disease, not by the symptoms that are that are apparent. Just as we treat infectious diseases by treating the the, the, the organism, we don't treat just the fever of the disease. We treat with antibiotics to kill the organism that's causing it. That's our goal. Symptoms are late. Uh, symptoms are the end of the uh, series of events. We need to get on the train at the very beginning. So for the thyroid disease, for all of the autoimmune diseases, thank you for giving me a chance to explain why it's important for us to think broadly of the autoimmune disease family. Thank you very much. And both a type 1 and a type 2 error, meaning we both miss some and we overdiagnose some. Uh, and the short answer is that, that rising, that there, there are two things that we use for uh, prediction with respect to antibody. It's uh, a rising titer, but more important, a rising number. That is, and again, almost every autoimmune disease, there's hardly an exception, is characterized by multiple autoantibodies. The more autoantibodies that are, that are relevant to the disease, more lupus autoantibodies, the more thyroid antibodies, and we measured three in our study, if you notice. There are more that we didn't study. The more of those you have and accumulate, the more likely you are to develop the disease. The other component is genetic, and I didn't deal with that on that particular slide, but the multiple antibody combined with genetics becomes predictive in the range of, of a um, sensitivity and specificity of over 90 percent. Now we're dealing with, you know, with levels where we would be willing to intervene. Um, and that comes from either a, a genome-wide search, which we don't do because that's very expensive, or what I call the poor man's um, mechanism, which is a family history. So in children with type 1 di diabetes, if we have at least uh, three of the major antibodies, and there are now five autoantibodies that are accumulating in the sibling of a diabetic child, the the likelihood that that child will develop diabetes within five years is well over 95 percent. So that is very high. Why don't we do something about it? The answer is we don't have an intervention that we could ethically give to a healthy child to prevent the disease. But if there is a disease where we could actually intervene and probably prevent the disease from ever occurring, sibling of a child with type 1 di di diabetes. So that's, that's our prime example. Lupus, we're further down the load. Thyroiditis, we know the accretion of disease is about 5% a year. In other words, if you have these three antibodies, or even you have two of the three antibodies, actually the antibodies to thyroglobulin and thyroid peroxidase, um, they, the, the, the accretion rate, the number of new patients uh, with that is about 5% a year. So the more years that go on, the more likely you are. These diseases develop very slowly, as you saw. I don't, you couldn't tell from the curves, but the antibodies develop over a very long period of time. So um, you're, you're dealing with situations where, frankly, the patient may die of something else before the autoimmune disease occurs. But they are quite predictive the disease will occur, just a matter of when, of, of timing. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. There are two autoimmune diseases where we know what the environmental factor is. One you're not concerned with. Um, I, I was, for, um, since I've been around a pretty long time, that is rheumatic fever, rheumatic fever in children. Uh, is, is basically caused by streptococcus, and we prevent that by vigorously treating children who have it with perennial antibiotics. The other is celiac disease. And we know that the trigger for celiac disease is gluten. And if we can diagnose people, we are getting better and better at doing that. And if they will go on a gluten-free diet, the disease will remit. So that's 
the prime example. And that works, and it is an example of how knowing the environmental trigger is a relatively inexpensive way of, of uh, ameliorating an autoimmune disease, preventing it or at least pre preventing it uh, recurrence. The problem is that, um, uh, that the gluten treatment is being tried with patients who don't have classical celiac disease, and we don't yet know whether there's a real clinical benefit there or not, and that's an issue which is still being discussed very much in the literature. But if you are diagnosed with legitimate celiac disease, then, then gluten-free diet will, will almost certainly cause remission. So that's, that's the prime example of, of treating a disease by measuring or, or by determining what is the environmental trigger. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rose. Um,